people are gonna start coming in here now. Share screen. Hi all, welcome. Uh, we typically, welcome to our, our faculty fellow lecture. We typically give um, everybody a couple minutes to get logged in and then we're going to get started. So we're going to start at about 6.02. Um, so just hang tight with us. Thank you very much for your patience. All right, attendance is looking pretty good this tonight. Thank you all for coming. All right, it's 6.02 on all my devices, so that means it's time to get started. Hello, and welcome to this evening's Zoom webinar that's been produced by the Honors College at West Virginia University. This event is the fourth of our five faculty fellow lectures taking place this fall semester. These lectures are designed to allow each Honors College Fellow an opportunity to provide an inside look into the innovative course they are currently teaching within the Honors College and will be teaching next spring semester. I'm Damien Clement, Associate Dean for WVU's Honors College. Tonight's lecture is entitled Ethics and Organ Transplant with Dr. Lindsay Bayondi. Dr. Bayondi is the Physician Director of Transplant, Surgical Director of Kidney Transplant, an associate professor in the surgery department at West Virginia University. We will follow our standard Zoom webinar platform for this, even, this evening. After the presentation, we will host an open question and answer session. Since we are using the Zoom webinar platform for this lecture, before we begin, let me review some basic features that will help you experience this evening's lecture in the best possible way. If you have issues with your audio or video at any point during the webinar, be sure to check your personal Zoom setting and your computer volume controls. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Due to enhanced security protocols, webinar attendees will not be able to see other questions, only their own. To answer a question, you must click on the Q&A button. A separate screen will appear. Then you may type your question. The presenter will answer all your questions live at the end of the presentation. If live captioning has been requested, it can be viewed by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. If live captioning was not requested, a captioned version of this recording will be available at honors.wvu.edu. And now let's get started with this evening's lecture. So it's my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Bayondi. I'm gonna stop my share and Lindsay, you can take it away. It's not letting me share now. What? We just had it sorted. I know. Oh, here we go. There yeah. you go. Yep. Yep. You're good. Great. Good evening. Thank you for coming to hear this presentation. I'm really excited about the class that I'm teaching. I've I'm titling today's lecture, Do You Want to Buy My Kidney? Ethical Dilemmas in, in Transplantation. 
we're going to just talk particularly about living donation, but I just want to introduce my class a little bit. Um, I am a transplant surgeon. Uh, I practice in uh, particularly in kidney transplant, living donor kidney transplant, um, and though I was trained in liver, kidney, and pancreas transplantation. I help uh, uh, I helped build the kidney program here as well as the heart transplantation program here at WVU. Um, but I really have a passion for ethics and I think it's a great platform to kind of get an introduction to bioethics and be, due to all the issues that are in transplantation. So tonight we're gonna just take a little snapshot of what we do in the class. Um, my class is uh, kind of multi-centric. We, we center on ethics but really it's a chance to get some background in medicine that you might not have gotten before, a little taste of some of the science behind transplantation, uh, what it's like to be a surgeon, a physician. So I hope to introduce you to different, um, different clinical uh, roles that, that hit the transplant field. So surgeon, nephrologist, some nurses, all, all different fields uh, of study, so that if you're interested in any kind of healthcare, it gives you a chance to interact with some of that. Um, and then also, um, you get to learn a little bit about the science behind it, and then we talk and discuss and, and talk about the ethical issues that come up. So um, we'll talk about a little bit of all of those things, and, and you'll see how much a hybrid class it is. I would say my class, uh, we have some reading every, for every session and then we mostly do a discussion and a reflective journal um, for the way we uh, show what we're learning throughout the semester. So we'll start with just some introduction to the science. Uh, what is organ transplantation? So I view organ transplantation as a gift of life from someone else, either a living or deceased patient person donates uh, an organ or a part of an organ. It is something that uh, uh, patients with organ failure need um, so you can see all the different organs that can be transplanted, heart, lung, kidney, liver, pancreas, intestines. You can do combinations of those things, such as a heart lung or a heart kidney. Uh, you can do a total abdominal organ, like a liver, pancreas, uh, kidney, and intestine. Um, we also do corneas, um, different tissue transplants. So even if you have uh, from organs, you may get a, a, a new tendon for your knee or for your ankle if you have an orthopedic injury all of those things come from donor organs and, and, and donors. So the organ transplant is placing a new solid organ uh, into a recipient's body sometimes we remove the old organ first sometimes we have to to make room so in the case of heart or lung transplant liver transplant we have to take out the old organ. Um, and then after the patient has the surgery, they require lifelong medication to prevent rejection and to allow them to have normal function. Um, let's, let's see. There's uh, two types generally of organ donors when you think about that. There are living donors. That's a person that goes into surgery electively. They didn't need surgery, but they give either a piece of their liver or one of their kidneys. Um, and they're alive and well after the surgery, that's the intent. So they, they go on about a normal life after donating. A deceased donor is the more common type of, of donor in the world, in this country, and it's someone who donates their organs after they die. So they're declared dead and their wishes are to help some other people that are in need and either their brain dead or cardiac death, um, meaning their heart stops, and then they go ahead and donate organs. Um, and we actually, take some time to explore what is death and, and just the concepts behind that because uh, it, it can actually be fascinating when you want to declare someone dead, uh, what that entails. So deceased donation is very important. One deceased donor can save up to eight lives through solid organ transplant. You can donate two lungs, a heart, a liver, a pancreas, two kidneys, intestines. And that same donor can help enhance the lives of up to 50 people through tissue donation. So as I said, tendons, uh, skin, those kinds of things. There are over 100,000 people currently on the list for an organ transplant in the United States, uh, more than would uh, fill even the largest football stadium. Every nine minutes, someone else is added to that list in our country. And about, uh, 17 people die every day waiting for an organ transplant, which is really a shame. It shows you how many organs we really need. 85% of those people are waiting for a kidney. Um, and what I will say is lots of people think they couldn't be an organ donor, but actually um, the 
biggest myth is that you have to be very young. Actually, one out of three of our donors in this country are over 50. And recently, um, a West Virginia veteran became the oldest, uh, oldest deceased donor at the age of 96. He donated his liver to a woman in Florida, and she is doing well. So what a great gift at the end of his long life. Um, we're going to talk specifically a little bit about kidney disease before we kind of get into the ethics. So uh, more than one in seven people have kidney disease in this country. The, the biggest reason is diabetes or high blood pressure, which uh, you may know in family members is very common. It's actually an expensive disease. It costs more than $90,000 every year to treat somebody who needs dialysis for their kidney failure. And one in five of those patients that start dialysis for their kidney failing will die every year. Um, this is a picture of someone that's hooked up to a hemodialysis machine. When your kidneys fail, you stop being able to filter the toxins from your blood. Um, and you may even stop making urine, so you can't filter water if you drink it. So that fluid has to be removed. And you can see there's that big white machine and there's blood tubes. And, and when you're on hemodialysis, you go three times a week at least for about four to five hours every time. They put needles in your usually into your arms and it exchanges and filters your blood so you can see that that would be uncomfortable inconvenient it takes a lot out of patients it makes them tired and difficult to go to work one you're missing a lot of time out of your week from your family um, it's a loss of income so if you're a young person it's hard to just continue on with normal family life or your your regular way of life um, there is a secondary type of dialysis called peritoneal dialysis, which is done nightly at home. So for those patients that need a kidney transplant, this is kind of what it looks like after the surgery. Um, I take a kidney, whether it's from a deceased or living donor, and I put it in not in the same place. I leave your old kidneys. If you need a kidney, you get your you leave your old kidneys in place unless you had a cancer or something. And I hook that kidney up down low close to your hip bone. It, it actually is attached to the blood vessels that go to your leg. I sew the artery and the vein to your, what's called your iliac artery and vein, and then attach the ureter, which is what drains urine from the kidney to your bladder so that the patient can um, actually urinate normally. Um, and then they end up taking medicines forever. Um, you can see from this graph that kidney transplant adds years to people's lives. So, Kidney failure and dialysis reduces the lifespan of a patient significantly. Um, and you can see the red line is different uh, life expectancy at one year of uh, starting dialysis or, or having a transplant at five years and 10 years compared with the deceased or living donor transplants in the blue or green. So starting dialysis is very bad for your life expectancy, but at, uh, getting a kidney can add many years to your life. Um, and just to add something to that, if there's people, most of you guys are probably in your 20s, for someone in their 20s with diabetes that starts on dialysis, their life expectancy is only about five to six years on average. Um, if we transplant them, their life expectancy can expand to over 20 years, and that's just with a first transplant. So obviously, that's what we want to do, especially for young people. So little bit of more basis, uh, basics on this. How do you get a transplant? It's actually a big process. You have to get put on a list and approved by a transplant center. You can pick where you go, but most people need to go close to home. It takes a lot of education and training. So they meet a big team, learn a little bit about what it's like to take care of themselves, and they get evaluated by myself, a surgeon, a kidney specialist, a social worker, financial people, a dietary a uh, nutrition consult, a pharmacy consult. They get lab work and medical tests to make sure they're safe and that they're gonna live long enough if they didn't have kidney failure to actually benefit from a transplant. The last thing I wanna do is put a kidney in someone who has a massive heart attack and dies before they even get out of the hospital. So you gotta make sure they're safe. So it actually is a multidisciplinary sport, we say, that requires a lot of, um, a lot of different people to make sure that, that one patient can get through the process safely. Um, there are some things that could prevent someone from being a transplant patient if they have cancers or infection or a very bad heart, um, sometimes smoking or very severe obesity, um, and then people who just can't take care of themselves if they aren't able to take medicines without losing track and they get too mixed up or if they're on drugs and they're not able to keep track of their life, those kind of things could prevent them from being transplanted. 
So this is just a picture of um, outcomes of patients on dialysis. The top line, um, when you start over at the y-axis, um, you can, that's um, from the day you start needing a, a transplant or needing to start dialysis, and then the months after getting a kidney transplant uh, along the, the x-axis. So you can see those lines decline, and the, long, the top line is for patients who are transplanted within six months of starting dialysis, and the bottom line is if they were on dialysis for more than two years before they got transplanted. And you can see those people have to wait longer, don't do as well. It just is hard on their bodies to be on dialysis. So the sooner they are listed and the sooner they get transplanted, the better. Um, unfortunately, the average waiting time for a deceased donor kidney is anywhere from three to 10 years with the average being around five to seven. So most patients don't have the option to get a deceased donor as quickly as they need for good health. Um, which is sad. We see people decline and not, then not be able to get transplanted, unfortunately. Um, why don't they get transplanted? Well, we don't have enough organs. Um, we have a big um, demand, but not a lot of supply. And you can see the green and blue lines are kind of steady down here. It just shows that every year we kind of recover the same number of, of kidneys from both living and deceased donors. And the number of transplants, uh, people waiting for transplants is the orange line. It's gotten higher and higher over the years. And again, lots of people are dying while they're waiting. Um, again, that graph, just to remind you that, that that is a big gap between how many people are waiting and how many people are actually donating. So we tell patients that the best option for them to get transplanted is a living donor. So someone who gives them their kidney a family member, a friend, because those kidneys will work better, they'll last longer, and the patients will live longer than if they waited for a transplant because it's a shorter waiting time. They might even avoid dialysis altogether if they get a living donor. Um, I think. So I have a question in there. Why is the need for transplants increased over the years? And uh, a couple things. Uh, one is that we have more obesity with more high blood pressure and more diabetes in this country. That's probably the biggest reason. Uh, so the more poorly controlled diabetics there are, the more people with high blood pressure or uh, obesity, the more people progress on to needing um, a kidney transplant. So living donation is best. Who can be a living donor for someone? Uh, it has to be an adult to donate a, a kidney. It has to be someone who's healthy. It can't be someone with diabetes who's going to progress on and need a kidney themselves. Um, that person needs to not have uh, transmittable infections, so we don't want to give somebody a kidney and give them an infection while we're at it. Um, those patients that donate need to not have significant medical problems, and then they need to be willing to donate and free of coercion and be able to understand the risks that they're going through. But a kidney donor doesn't have to be a relative they can be a friend they can be a family member they can but they can be a stranger even we sometimes have people approach us and say hey i had an aunt die of kidney failure i'd like to donate to someone on the list and there that's called an altruistic donor they'll just go ahead and donate and we will give it to the person next on the list that's appropriate for that kidney also we sometimes have people that want to donate to a family member and they're not a match meaning their blood is not compatible with their um potential recipients. So we do something called a swap. You can see that little chart in the top where you had a, uh, the donor one and recipient one, they're not compatible. And then the little pair at the bottom, they're not compatible. So the first donor gives to the second recipient that they don't know and the donor, um, the other donor gives to their recipient. So you just flip flop them. Um, sometimes we do that in a series of chains and there's been up to 30 and 40 people in chains. You might have seen there was a very big one in New York a few years ago that was featured in the New York Times, but it, it had upwards of 40 people involved in a chain, all starting from one uh, altruistic donor, which is really cool. So who can, who can donate a kidney? Going back to that, we're very careful about making sure we select the appropriate patient to, um, to donate. We do an extensive uh, workup to make sure they're safe. First, we educate the potential donor, make sure that they're really not being uh, wrangled into it, forced into it. We do a lot of medical testing. We do um, evaluation of their health and their potential for kidney failure long-term. And then they have to agree to follow up so we know that they're safe and healthy um, long-term. Uh, 
and I speak to the decision making process of how some people are given priority. Um, I will talk about allocation at the end. I will get to that. Um, so part of the living donor process is also making sure that donor is not being coerced. Every once in a while, you'll have someone show up and someone's trying to make them donate for one way or another, financial or familial pressure. So we have what's called a living donor advocate. That person is uh, a specially trained um, advocate just for the donor, and we'll talk about that. Um, as part of the evaluation, they also see a specialized nurse that's trained to teach them. They see myself, a surgeon, a kidney specialist, and all the rest of the team, social work, financial, and we all talk to them about their risks and, and what it would be like to donate. Again, that living donor advocate, we call them an ILDA, they're crucial to the process. They all, they can be a number of different specialties. The ones here are actually chaplains. Um, but they have background in ethics and transplant. They learn a lot about living donation and their responsibility is to represent the donor and make sure that they get all the advice they need on, on where to answer their questions, um, how to, they make sure the donor's interests are being protected. If they feel like they're being coerced or if they don't have enough information, they help them find what they need. They're often a sounding board as well. So they're a really great asset and they're not employed by the transplant department. So we can't say, oh, please make sure we find donors. There, there's no there's no coercion that way either. Something else that's important about living donors is that we maintain their confidentiality. We can't tell their potential recipients about their information. So if you show up to donate to your mom and your mom is our patient, uh, we don't give your information to your mom about your workup. Even if mom calls in and says, oh, is my donor almost ready to donate? Where are we in the process? I'm ready to get transplanted. We say, we can't tell you any of that. That's their protected information um, because we don't want to cause problems that way. There's a few exceptions, like mandatory uh, infectious disease reporting, that kind of thing. But generally um, speaking, it all maintains confidentiality. We never tell the, the recipient anything. So um, another question we get a lot is, can a donor be paid? A lot of people say, well, if you need kidneys, why don't we pay donors? And that's a great question. Currently in the United States, it is illegal to buy or sell uh, an organ. It's actually a federal crime. And that includes exchanging a gift or a vacation or any other valuable commodity that um, the donor actually can be put in jail as well as the recipient and the, and the transplant team. So we stay away from that. I will say that the recipient the, uh, who is getting the kidney, their insurance or Medicare pays for the donation. So it's not uh, a cost to the donor to donate, but they, uh, you, they do take time off work. So probably we could do better in this country about supporting the donor while they miss work without actually buying and selling organs. But that's a whole other topic for our class, actually. So um, laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. This is how we normally take out the kidney for a donor. So a nephrectomy is just the word for removal of a kidney. A laparoscopic surgery is the little camera surgery. So you may have had a gallbladder out or your appendix out. We use little tiny cameras that are about the size of my pinky finger. And we put those cameras in and look around the abdomen and we're, I'm able to do a lot of stuff without even putting my hand inside the abdominal cavity. So that's how I take out kidneys. You can see on this um, little picture the, where the incisions are, all those three or four incisions are less than a centimeter or a centimeter and a half. Um, basically the width of my pinky finger. I put cameras and instruments through there um, and get the kidney all freed up and ready to take out uh, of the donor. Now, a kidney is about the size of your fist, so it's not gonna fit through a pinky size incision. So at the very end, I make an incision right down by the pubic bone. Um, it actually looks like a small C-section uh, incision. And we, I put a bag into the belly, I put the kidney into the bag and pull the bag out. And that's how I get the kidney out. So I never actually put my hand into the um, donor, which is nice. It allows them to recover more quickly. Uh, as soon as we take the kidney out, it's sent immediately to the recipient's operating room. Uh, we get it prepped up and, and transplanted immediately, uh, most commonly. So I think we had a question from the audience about, is this safe? What happens if the donor needs a transplant? So in general, living donation is safe, but we have to pick the right people. So if we pick unhealthy people or high risk donors, then it's not a safe thing. And that's why we do such an extensive evaluation. 
And the donor has to really make an informed choice knowing what their risks are compared to other people. So what are the risks? With any surgery you go into, no matter what it is, there's always a risk that you could die um, from having surgery, from bleeding or another complication. The risk of dying in the hospital from donating your kidney is about 0.007%. So seven in 100,000 donors. Um, that's based on data over the past 15,000 donors done from 2008 to 2012. So um, just a, a good big study that gave us that data. Um, you can compare that to a lap cholecystectomy, which is taking out your gallbladder, which has a 0.4% mortality or um, a laparoscopic appendectomy, so taking out your appendix with a camera, and that is a 0.2%. So it's much lower than those very common operations, but the donor didn't need that operation, so they didn't actually need a surgery, and there's still a mortality risk. When we look at their risk of dying for the first three months after donating, that risk is about 3.1 in 10,000 surgeries, or 0.03%. So it's still much lower, but it's not zero. Now that 90 day all cause mortality means every donor, whether they go get hit by a car the day that they're discharged from the hospital, whether their kidney fails and they, or they bleed, all of those, all of those are counted in that. Um, that risk is about the same risk of dying in a car wreck on the highway. That's about the closest thing I can compare it. So it's a risk people take every day, but it's not zero. These are some of the other complications that can happen when you have this surgery. This is a picture of a man who had what we call an open nephrectomy. So a big open incision, rather than using the cameras to taking out his kidney. This is what you'll see a lot in other countries where there are paid donors and they're legal, where a lot of poor patients are paid a small amount of money to donate their kidney in the hopes that they'll make their life better. So that's the incision they get, big difference in recovery. It's also a potential incision you could get if there's a big complication in your laparoscopic surgery, but that's less than 1% um, would get a surgery like that. About 1% to 3% would need some um, form of opening in the smaller incision as well. So I think we have a hand raised, but I don't know how to see that. I'm not sure how to do that. So we'll come to the questions at the end, maybe put it in the chat. When I look at complications from this surgery, um, it's about 15 to 18% of people will have some kind of a complication, whether they have stomach upset, so that's a GI complaint, or feeling constipated, or some nausea after surgery, that's the most common. Some people who would get short of breath or get a pneumonia after having the breathing tube, about 3% of people will bleed, less than 1% would need a blood transfusion, and about 1%, less than 1% would need a reoperation for a hernia or a bowel obstruction. So obviously we don't like it when that happens, but it can happen with any surgery. Um, risk factors for the complications. There are some patients that are um, higher risk for complications. That uh, first one should actually say patients with high blood pressure. So if you already have high blood pressure before you donate, you're at higher risk for complications. Black donors actually are at higher risk for complications as well. 3.7% um, of black donors will have complications compared with 2.2%. Um, that is poorly defined why that happens. Um, uh, so there's more research that needs to be done into that. The other complications can be due to obesity, people who have bleeding disorders, actually patients with underlying psychiatric illness. Um, you, if you've heard of the robot for surgery, that actually is a higher complication rate than um, the total laparoscopic, which is what I told you about. Um, and now I have a, the question was, do other countries without laws preventing uh, getting paid for organs have a much higher donation rate? Uh, it, that's a good question, and the answer is it depends. So if we pay, if you pay for donors, you do have a slightly higher donation rate, but those often go to people who don't actually live in that country. So it's it's iffy, uh, and there's a lot of ethical discussion on that that we, we would have in this class as well. Um, so again, what about long-term complications? This gets back to the question that uh, was raised a minute ago. Uh, what if the patient loses their kidney function after they donate their first one, one of two kidneys? What happens if the other one goes bad? 
the short answer to that is they would get put at the top of the list for a deceased donor transplant. Heaven forbid that happen. Um, previous donors are given a significant amount of points and usually are transplanted within a few weeks of losing their kidney uh, if they were a previous donor, with the exception of if they've become too sick. So I have had a couple patients that donated to children or to a sibling 30, 40 years ago, and they're now 85, those patients may not get transplanted because they're just too old. Um, but we, if they were going to get transplanted, if they were healthy enough for it, they would get transplanted very quickly. So what's the risk to your kidney function? Well, when you lose one kidney, um, you lose half of your kidney volume, but over time, the, the, the remaining kidney makes up for a lot of that. And you end up with uh, a loss of 25 to 40 percent of your total kidney function. We make sure we start with enough uh, reserve that we aren't taking it out of someone who doesn't have enough reserve. However, a donor has about a 3.4 time risk of end stage renal disease, that's ESRD, compared with a healthy person that didn't donate. So if you took identical populations and half of them donated and the other half didn't, it would be a 3.4 time risk. Now, it's still a very low risk. If you took the general population of unhealthy people and healthy people, your lifetime risk for kidney failure is a little over 3%. For a donor, it's still less than 0.9%, but that's compared to a non-donor of 0.14%. So still very, very low risk, but it's possible. There's no data to show that it would shorten your life expectancy. So um, that's a good thing. People live long, healthy lives. And the first time we looked at data from that was actually in Korean War veterans that lost one kidney. And we show, uh, that data shows that they live the same life expectancy as people who didn't lose a kidney. Kind of a funny way to do the study. Um, there are other small risks over, over time of having increased risk of high blood pressure when you get older or having pregnancy complications if you've donated one kidney. Let's see. Um, so how is a donor surgery, a laparoscopic donor surgery, different than any other surgery? Well, there's no medical benefit to donating. So I'm taking a totally healthy person and they're having a surgery that does have risk and they didn't need it. So, you know, we talk about the Hippocratic Oath, which is not exactly what doctors follow, but it's the concept of do no harm. Don't do anything intentionally that will harm people. So how do we weigh the do no harm with the, I'm gonna operate on someone who doesn't necessarily need an operation? It's an interesting question, right? The first time someone donated a kidney, I was in 1954, there were twins and one brother wanted to donate to his twin who was in kidney failure. And at that time uh, there was no dialysis. So kidney failure was a immediate death sentence. And so the brother said, hey, please let me donate my kidney. Um, and a psychiatrist came to evaluate him because they, they didn't have all the infrastructure we did. Um, and he said, huh, I think it's an important question. Should we put him under the pressure of donating? And that psychiatrist said, we don't have the right to do that because there's a potential danger. Now, ultimately that twin did donate um, and it was decided by a number of people in the medical community, clergy, other psychiatrists that, that, that donation seemed like a good option. Um, and the real reason for that was that the twins, the twin that was healthy said that his life would never be the same if his twin died. He was used, used to his twin as his best confidant, his friend, and that life without him was going to be so much less worthwhile that it was a benefit for him to go on, under the operation. So that's how that was initially uh, weighed, was that that benefit to him, while it wasn't medical, was psychological. And so that's why he was allowed to go under the knife and, and donate. So taking a step back, now that you have a little medical background, we're going to talk about how do we use that medical background and analyze ethical issues? Because y'all are asking great questions already. There's a lot of ethical issues. Should we pay for organs? Should we, who should get the organs? Who, should we even operate on these people? So, so some of the things we talk about in the class is how to do an analysis of an ethical issue. And that applies to transplant or all of life, really. The first thing we talk about is consider multiple perspectives. Whose voice isn't being heard? Um, who's going to be affected by your decision? You can't just talk to the one patient or 
You need to talk to the family member. You need to talk to the other patients that might be affected by not receiving the care that that first person is, is receiving. What about the doctors, the nurses? What about the public health perspective? There's a lot of different perspectives that can be um, taken into account. Um, is your source biased or one-sided? A lot of times we get information. I mean, most of you know that if you listen to Fox News or CNN, you're gonna get two different perspectives. So you have to think about that in every situation, especially when you're trying to weigh what's right and wrong. Is your source biased or one-sided and do you need to get some other opinions from other side, other views? And are you missing information? Sometimes you'll have a, a source with good information, but they leave out facts because either they don't know them or, or they're just not aware of them. Can you think about the problem in a different way, even if you don't agree? And I think that's really important as we're doing these bioethical analyses of, of different problems, uh, both current and when we look at historic things. So we also use the principles of bioethics. There's, um, and we'll just touch on them briefly, but what are the things we consider? The four things that are most commonly considered when we talk about ethical dilemmas in medicine are the following. First is beneficence. So that's basically a fancy word for doing good, um, particularly the a physician's obligation to act for the benefit of their patient, not just to avoid harm. So it's not just, I'm not gonna hurt them, but I'm gonna do things to intervene to help them. It's a, a requirement for positive investment into, into the patient or to the person. The second thing is non-maleficent. So I'm not gonna do harm. I'm not gonna kill. I'm not going to maim or hurt people on purpose. Um, and one of those things that, that really comes that we'll talk about, we actually talked about in class today is what we call the dead donor rule. So I'm not gonna take organs from somebody that's not quite dead, right? They need to be an actual dead donor if we're calling them a deceased donor. Now the difference is a living donor who's choosing to live, donate, and then go on with their life. The third principle we talk about is autonomy. So that's your ability to make, make choices for yourself, to have self-determination. We, I think most of us would agree that we should all have the right, assuming that we have the ability to, and capacity to make a decision for self-determination. But that also has to be weighed with some of the other principles. So someone might say they have autonomy to um, kill somebody. Well, that's not going to be outweighed by the, the non-maleficence, right? You can't kill somebody just because it's your strong desire. Um, so that's a simple analogy of, the, of weighing those two principles. And then the fourth principle we talked about is justice. So fair and equitable treatment of all people, all kinds of people. And then a subset of that is distributive justice. So in medicine, there's sometimes not enough resources. So we have to be able to distribute those fairly. So that goes to the question about organ allocation. Who gets a kidney when? And we talk about this in our class as well. So if you're interested in it, it's a plug for the class, but how, how do we decide? Who decides? Who gets a kidney? Is it, should it always be a young person? Should it be uh, equal for young and old people? Should it be the person who's gonna benefit the most? Should it be the person who lived the best life? I think most people determine that we can't figure out who lived the best life, so we're gonna throw that right out. We do have an allocation system in this country that weighs a number of principles, um, but right now is, uh, for kidneys is based primarily on the time you've been on the list to try to be fair. Um, so justice is something we have to weigh against all these other things. So we're gonna go through some cases because I feel like that's the best way to talk about ethics. And you can try to get on the, the Q&A if you have an answer to this. Um, the first case is a 72 year old man with diabetes and coronary artery disease that's heart disease he wants to donate a kidney to his wife on dialysis he's not on medications for his diabetes he's on diet control but he's had a bunch of stents put in his heart in the past because he's had heart attacks but he wants to donate so discussion we know that diabetes is the leading cause of kidney failure so he is at very high risk of kidney failure and he's also at high risk of having a heart attack on the table um, because he's had so much heart disease. So he's an extremely high risk medical patient. The donor says, I don't care. I wanna help my wife. She's the love of my life. I won't sue you if I die. Just take my kidney. So what do we do? 
in looking at this case, we would say the patient does have autonomy. He's clear that would that would push for him to donate. There's some beneficence there. He wants his wife to live. There's a lot of push for him to help his wife. Um, but what about the non maleficence the do no harm, the risk of him dying on the table, the risk of him having kidney disease. Also, there's a lot of regulation that we'll, we can talk about in the class uh, of kidney programs and transplant programs. If we have bad outcomes, they'll close the program. That would then hurt lots of patients in the area. What about my responsibility as a surgeon not to harm him, not to make him have a heart attack just because he wants to help his wife? So there's a lot of things to weigh. Anyone wait, want to weigh in on what they think should happen with this patient? I'll wait just a second. Um, I'll go on with what we what we decided with this patient, and that was what we told him no. We said that he was very high risk. He said, no, give me a second chance to be considered. So we, we brought in that independent living donor advocate, and we discussed it a little bit. We offered him a second opinion at another center, um, and then we talked to him about being an advocate for his wife to find someone else to donate to her who would be a safer option. So that was case one. The second case is, was an interesting one we had about a year ago, a 39 year old woman who was approved to donate a kidney to her husband right before we scheduled their surgery she got COVID. So we had to delay there were some issues that you have to do some heart testing after someone has COVID before they can donate. Right before we were going to reschedule their operating room our social worker in the office found out that the couple was separated they didn't tell us the wife left the husband and the husband said I don't want her kidney anymore I think we may get a divorce. The wife called and said, I really feel bad. I still love him. I'm just not living with him. I want to donate anonymously. Even though he doesn't want my kidney, let me give it to him and just don't tell him. So we said, ooh, I, that, there's not a lot of precedent for doing that. What a, whose autonomy is more important? Typically, we don't accept an anonymous donation um, to a specific recipient. What if their divorce goes through? Could we do harm? to one of them because there could be a suit that would involve the kidney transplant and what would that mean for their their divorce proceedings so we weighed that a little bit and after a lot of talking um, we decided not to proceed with that try that case until they had some time away from their separation to kind of weigh things and reconsider so that got put on pause uh, let's talk about a third case and, and weigh in if you're interested in weighing in. So this is a case that was in the news in Texas. I'm from Texas, but there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens there sometimes. But this case was a national news. It was a death row inmate who wanted to donate a kidney. So he was seeking a 30 day reprieve before he was executed. He um, had admitted to terrible crimes. He said, yes, I want to donate. Um, please give me a stay of execution so I can make amends by donating. What do you do? Um, there's a little historical precedence to this. So in 1977, there was a Utah man in the same position. He said, I'm so sorry. I want to give my organs to someone because I was a terrible person. I want to make amends before I die. Somehow he requested and was granted a firing squad because he thought that, that would allow him to donate. And his body was actually taken to the University of Utah um, and attempted to donate his organs after he was executed by firing squad. Now it turns out a firing squad is not very good for your organs and none of them were transplantable. So he was not able to donate organs as far as is known to the public. But that leads us to a great question. Should prisoners be allowed to donate? Should they get a stay of execution for a period of time? Um, any thoughts on that? Anyone wanna respond in the chat? Um, when we weigh that case, and we talked about it as a group just to see what we would do, um, we said, well, a donor does have autonomy, but, but can you have autonomy? Can you make a personal choice when you know that it's your best chance at not dying yet, even if it's for a month and it will stay your execution? There is a lot of personal gain for that. Is there any way to tell that they're not being coerced? Would a donor advocate be able to say they're not being coerced? On the other hand, they're really helping someone. We have a long waiting list. It would help that waiting list by, by giving more organs. Um, the other question was the question of non-maleficence. If they're donating and then they immediately die, wouldn't that make the, the person who took their organs out be an executioner? 
So I don't think there's any transplant surgeon who would want to take their organs out and then have them pass away immediately. That would be um, really against the do not kill. So interesting, is there a way to do that so that um, they could donate and then recover and then later on be executed? I mean, it's very morbid, but are there ways to do it? Are there, there any, anybody who has thoughts about that? Um, another problem is we have to be monitored after patients donate. They have to live for two years or the, the center gets in trouble for, for having poor outcomes. So obviously if they're executed, that's gonna be an issue for, for center outcomes. A paper was written on this recently by the Ethics uh, Committee of the National uh, Transplant, uh, basically the federal government wing of, uh, for transplant um, called the OPTN. And they said that trading uh, a reduced sentence for organ issues definitely raises issues. Um, and that even if the donor found to be medically unsuitable but tried, it could possibly even increase the death penalty in a, an attempt for politicians to gain organs. So there's a lot of, of interesting concepts of if we say, oh, yeah, you can donate your organs, oh, would, would other people try to increase the death penalty so we could have more transplants? And again, the idea that we would be executioners as the organ transplant team. So a lot of issues. I don't see a lot of favor uh, in gaining in this uh, arena, but but interestingly, it's something that's happening in China. So in 2006, there were a couple of uh, Canadian uh, investigators and lawyers that um, basically disclosed um, a real problem in China. Now, I, I have a couple of people who entered the chat. I'd be wary of coercion and prisoners being pressured to donate organs and, and a sort of extension of black market. I think that's a good point. Essentially, prisoners being used for organ harvesting, and that's what we're going to get to. Uh, and the second, there's a question, are non-death penalty prisoners allowed to donate? The answer is sometimes they are, yes. Um, there have been non-death penalty uh, prisoners do be living donors and then go on to um, live in prison for a long time. So in China, unfortunately, it was discovered that um, they were using a large scale organ trafficking uh, process by actually executing prisoners for their organs. China, uh, even up until 2019, it was found that they were using a lot of their political dissidents and ethnic prisoners uh, and, and basically executing them for their organs, including hearts. Uh, it was seen in a bunch of their studies in transplantation. They, they were shown to have donation after cardiac death heart transplant. So you could see large series of, uh, of, of hearts that were taken from prisoners and transplanted. Some of these organs are believed to be transplanted into transplant tourists, so people that traveled from other countries, including the United States, to get organs. So people paying to get an organ from a, an executed prisoner. Um, yeah, there absolutely um, are ways to execute patients so that they are eligible to donate after they die. Um, all the Western uh, countries really outcried a lot about this. They said, listen, this makes the surgeon that's taking out organs possibly be the executioner. You're, you're basically using prisoners for a, a, a commodity um, and it's completely uh, against the, the principles of beneficence and justice. So um, it's not known whether this truly continues. There's a lot of suspicions that parts of China still continue this, but it's a little bit unclear. So interesting, but sad. Uh, we're going to go on to the next case, um, which is a case of a potential donor that uh, comes in for an evaluation uh, who says they have a history of lots of depression and uh, suicidal ideation. So thinking about uh, killing themselves, committing suicide. They're really flat. They look sad. They look depressed. They're avoiding eye contact. When the social worker comes out of the room after evaluating this potential donor, they see it's a daughter. They see that the father, who is the recipient, is sitting very close to the door. And the social worker really got the impression that that dad, the potential recipient, is hovering. Um, we don't normally allow the potential recipient, recipient in the room for a donor evaluation to prevent that kind of coercion. The social worker refers that donor to psychiatry. 
And the donor discloses that her father is physically, emotionally, and verbally abusive to her, and that the psychiatrist thinks that she has PTSD from the abuse. Um, the donor agrees to mental health therapy. Now, the entire transplant team deems that that donor should not donate. It's uh, they're being coerced. That they're um, that it's really a a situation of true coercion, but the, but fear of, of not donating, that the father would retaliate if she did not donate. So what what is the transplant center? What do we do as a group? So the coordinator says we could just say she's not suitable, but the donor says she's afraid her father will not believe this because she's young and she's healthy. Ultimately, the team decision was to say that there was complicated anatomy and that she had to be ruled out because she wasn't transplanted due to complicated anatomy in her kidney making her difficult and notified that the case is closed. It turns out that this is a fairly common thing. It's called a medical out for donation. It is used occasionally in situations like this. What do you think about this? What's our responsibility to protect, to do no harm to the donor who may be coerced or in a bad situation? Does that make it right to falsify medical information if a donor's well-being is at stake? Um, there's a lot of debate about that. Is the doing good better than the lying? Um, does the means justify the end? Uh, it, there's a lot of debate on whether that should happen or not. Um, I don't know if you guys have thoughts that you'd like to put in the chat on that, but I think it's a, a place that we can have a lot of discussion in the class. Um, if, if you join, I think it's an interesting uh, conversation. And really the transplant community can't agree on this um what if they go to another center and that center doesn't realize that it was basically a, a cover story and then they they out the donor they could, they could get caught in the lie um the, when the records are uncovered how do you maintain the lie over time with a family would that cause trust issues with the even with the, the medical team uh the medical team that continues to care for the father who was given the the lie so to speak so there's a lot of issues there which are interesting. I think maybe we have time for probably not any more cases. I don't know if we have time or not. Or maybe time for questions. Let's let's open it up. Let's open it up for questions. Okay. So we got probably about eight more minutes, folks. What 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 if any questions would we have for, for Dr. Bayandi after this? Pretty awesome and excellent presentation. Dr. Bayandi, I learned a lot. Oh, thank you. Good. I learned a lot. Oh, I think we have a comment. I, I never thought about a situation like this. Personally, I'm unsure what the correct thing to do, but definitely an interesting case study, study to listen and discuss. Yeah, I, I, I think that's where sometimes we um, don't know what to do and we have to discuss it. And I think the discussion is important. I think it's important to the integrity of how we practice even. Even when we debate, the ability to hear and try to work through the best solution we can come up with. So if the father's found to be abusive and the daughter is a minor, would CPS be involved? Absolutely. So if the, she, if the donor daughter was a minor, she couldn't be even evaluated for donation. So that's a good thing. Um, but uh, coercion um, due to abuse unfortunately we sometimes would fall into mandatory reporters but um typically they're not uh, patients that fall into mandatory reporting we certainly will report if our patients will allow us to but a lot of times we don't those patients would not fall into that category i will also say fortunately it's not that common it's a, a pretty uncommon thing um next question if someone receives a kidney donation kidney donation and dies in a freak accident, could their donor kidney then be donated to another person? So someone who has a transplanted kidney sometimes can go on to donate that kidney again. Um, yeah, that does happen occasionally. Um, can medications that people take affect whether or not they donate organs? Yeah, some of the medications people take can damage your kidney. And so then we um, will not allow them to donate because of that damage or because damage that could occur in the future. Uh, if you were to donate a kidney, does it cost money and does it require you to have insurance? So it's not supposed to cost money, but um, because the insurance for the person receiving the kidney uh, should pay for it. However, most people need to take time off work 
and up until now, there is no really way to pay people for their time off work that's legal. We're really lobbying with the government to change, make a caveat that that time off work can be paid. Now, FMLA can be used, and that's uh, fortunate, but you know, time off work is is money, and so in that way, we do lose a little money. You don't have to have insurance, though. We encourage everyone to try to get insurance after they donate, just in case something else happens. I think that's just important for health. And as a donor, can you get in contact with the recipient and vice versa? So yeah, um, we encourage after deceased donation, we encourage our recipients to write a thank you card to the donor family. Uh, that is exchanged through a somewhat anonymous uh, a source so that they initially can send a thank you without sending um, information that so it's, it's gone through a third party. Um, if both parties are interested, then we do connect families and that actually happens a lot. It's really a nice thing. So there are many donor families that get to know the recipients or one or two of the recipients of their loved ones families. It gives them a lot of comfort. I think I've seen donors get to listen to the heart of their deceased parent or child. I mean, as heartbreaking as it is, I think there's a lot of comfort in that. Um, and I've seen friendships developed. I had a, a woman who anonymously donated a kidney, um, living donor kidney, and she met her recipient about six months later. We helped them meet when they both wanted to, and they've actually been friends for years, and you would never expect it. They're, they're a very unlikely pair of friends, but it, it's a really neat um, thing that happens sometimes. So do we have any other questions for Dr. Bayani? Lindsay, this was this was awesome. I, I, I always like to say I, I enjoy coming to these lectures because I don't know what I'm going to get and I get a good understanding of the class, but I'm like, wow, if I could take your class, I would because it's interesting. Thank you. Yes. Yes, this class is being offered next semester. Someone asked that in the in the chat, it will Yes, it's been offered next semester. I don't know the time and the, the time of day or anything to that nature, but it will be offered next semester. Yes. It will be a three credit class and I believe it's a GF2, I, I believe. So. Yeah, it's a GF2, so. Okay, so Lindsay, we, we appreciate the opportunity to visit with you this evening. If you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Bayondi. I will place Dr. Bayondi's email in the chat. Copy. Place Thank it you, here guys. in the uh, chat. Awesome. We will have a, um, an archive copy of this webinar will be available soon. Uh, thank you for spending this time with us. Um, everybody, please have a good afternoon or good evening. Lindsay, again, thank you so very much for your time you and so for much. your excellent lecture. Everyone have a good afternoon or good evening. Bye-bye.